to our final session for the Denver Streets for People Summit. Uh, this is now our signature closing session called the Fast and Curious. And so our theme for this is transit and the past, present, future of Denver Streets. But you're going to hear more about that from our actual speakers in a second. Um, I know that you're all professionals now with Microsoft Teams, so I don't need <laughs> to go over all of the details. Um, but uh, keep yourself muted while our speakers are talking. Um, you'll note that the session is being recorded. Um, you can open up the chat box to uh, introduce yourself and send questions to our speakers. We will have a little panel um, and time for Q&A at the end. Um, and then you can hit those little three dots if you want to open up closed captioning or adjust anything else. Um, this is our welcoming statement or our code of conduct that you all saw and have seen probably several times already this week. We've had really great, uh, respectful, awesome conversations all week. So thank you all for being a part of that. Um, and this event has been very uh, welcoming and positive and I've loved every session. So thank you for uh, being a part of that with us. Um, so this session uh, is, I'll introduce our MC for the event and hand it over to there. Um, so that's Justin Adams and Justin, I'm going to let you take it from here and be way more enjoyable than I am. <laughs> oh, Kayla, thank you so much. And uh, as always, it's an honor to be able to be able to MC uh, such a wonderful event, especially the last part, which is the most important part out of all of this. Now, before we get things going, got to let you know, um, first of all, social media, which is always very important. You got to go and promote yourself, right? You can find me at Justin Adams TV again, Justin Adams TV on Twitter and as well as Instagram. So now that we have the commercial out the way, let's talk about our stars and what they're doing tonight, today. And um, what we're talking about is just how transportation plays an integral role in creating infrastructure in our city. While much of our street grid has been in place for many decades, the way that we use streets has evolved dramatically over time as cars have come to dominate much of our public spaces. Now this session is going to excite you and inspire you. We, we've done this before a little bit and it is amazing. Now we have three quick presentations showcasing stories and histories of transportation endeavor and shared ideas for reclaiming streets for all people. So just to get this party started, let's start off with Ryan Keeney who talks about Denver streetcar legacy. And it's really interesting to see how it started from the late 1800s to how it affects us today, Ryan. I think we're waiting for Ryan to get started in a little bit. Ryan, are you with us? Ryan, you're on mute. Well, can we start that, <laughs> start that over? It really helps if uh, you think I would have learned this by now, but uh, I still fail to unmute myself on a regular basis. I uh, had, sorry, I was on mute as uh, one of my bingo ones. All right, all right, can we get this? All right, um, can we get the timer reset? I have to like be. You got a lot of content. <laughs> Ryan, how about we do this? How about this? We're going to get the timer reset. Let's all take a deep breath and right. let's get ready for Ryan, who's got a whole lot of different things going on, my man. Ryan, you're the man with the master plan. Tell us about Denver Streetcar Legacy. Um, all right, here we go. Today, I'm going to go back to the past and talk about Denver's transportation history, how it's like, and how its lasting legacy shapes the city to this day and the way we get around in it. Much of this material comes from my capstone project that I completed in 2017 for my GS master's degree at DU. This project is a publicly available online story map that showcases all this history. So I focus on three ideas, streetcars, pedestrian friendly commercial districts, and neighborhood walkability. Denver's old streetcars, which existed between 1872 and 1950, spawned commercial developments on their routes. Many of these developments still remain here today and enhance the functional walkability of the neighborhoods in which they are located by virtue of their close proximity to residences. Once upon a time, there were no cars in Denver. In 1861, when Denver, when Denver was incorporated, people traveled around town by foot or by horse. By 1870, the town had grown to a population of 4,700 people and clearly needed a modern transportation system. In 1872, the Denver Horse Railroad Company built the first public transit line in Denver, a horse-drawn carriage from Auraria to Curtis Park. By 1880, the trackage expanded modestly, but the population had ballooned sevenfold to 35,000. News reports at the time lamented the inadequate state of the network. In the face of pent up demand and continued population growth, the 1880s saw the biggest single decade expansion in its 78 year history. 
By 1890, the population tripled to 106,000, and nearly every block in downtown and mon modern Kernis Park had a streetcar line. Lines covered the full length of Broadway and Colfax, and the northwest side around Berkeley had multiple routes. They were built by many fiercely competitive startup companies, and competition was so intense that on one occasion, one company would rip up the rails of another while building their own. We also had new means of conveyance. Cable cars pulled by moving cables along tracks, driven by a central powerhouse, which the cable cars latched onto for propulsion. And we also had the electric streetcar powered by overhead wires. Uh, these were superior, uh, and as a result of the recession in 1893, uh, the Denver Tramway emerged as a monopoly because they owned all these lines. Uh, in 1917, the streetcar system reached its peak in terms of coverage. Um, but after this was a long decline, ridership peaked in 1910, uh, and there were 3,000 cars present in the city. By 1928, the number of private automobiles increased to 78,000, and streetcar ridership declined by 59%. In the 20s and 30s, uh, many railroads converted to bus and electric trolley coaches, uh, and after World War II, the economy boomed, and a huge push for modernization in all aspects of life occurred. And so the removal of the streetcars accelerated, and the last one ran in 1951. Denver once existed as a very compact city thanks to the influence of the streetcar. As late as 1933, development of the city was tightly bound to streetcar lines. This was because people had to walk to and from the streetcar stops in order to get around the city. This naturally limited development uh, to about one half mile from the stops. Additionally, commercial centers also appeared on the same streets as the streetcar right of way. This allowed people walking to and from the streetcars to purchase goods and services before continuing on their way. Today, the streetcars are gone, but the street grid and these commercial centers remain. The most obvious examples are the continuous corridors on arterial streets like Broadway and Colfax, that they are also, but they are also scattered on more neighborhood-oriented streets like South Pearl near Florida, Gaylord at Mississippi, and Tennyson at 41st. These notes are particularly special because they lack the noisy and dangerous automobile traffic of bigger streets and are therefore more pleasant for the pedestrian. Because no official term existed, I decided to call them streetcar neighborhood commercial development or SNCDs for short. SNCDs are clusters of pedestrian oriented commercial buildings which are situated around abandoned streetcar lines on roads with fewer than four vehicle lanes. In the story map, you can see the location of every SNCD in the city and I categorize them on their, based on their size proportion of sidewalk fronting buildings in their health. So we have on the left an exceptional main street at Gaylord in Mississippi, which is at least a full 600 foot city block with almost nonstop buildings flush with the sidewalk accessible to the pedestrian. And on the right, we've got a quality cluster, which is just basically a smaller version of that, not, a, not large enough. At first in Knox on the left, we've got a mixed main street, which is another 600 foot long corridor, but it's more of a mixture there's a little more parking lots and things mixed in there, but there's also a lot of street facing buildings too. And then where I live at 11th and Ogden in Capitol Hill, we've got that same idea, except it's smaller in size. And then lastly, we've got corner stores, uh, which are scattered throughout the city, individual buildings. And then we have uh, degraded or destroyed. Many uh, of these corridors were either converted exclusively to residential use, or they were com almost completely destroyed like Old West Colfax which you can see in the 1933 black and white image. Um, so the final section of the story map provides a case study of how these SNCDs affect the functional walkability of two study areas. Walkability here refers to the ability of a pedestrian starting at a given property parcel to access neighborhood amenities within a one half mile sidewalk distance. The neighborhood amenities include grocery stores, retail stores, convenience stores, restaurants, schools, daycares, and entertainment venues. So here are two maps showing some of the results. The left-hand map shows a number of different destination categories, the number of diff different destination categories that each property parcel can access. And the right hand shows the number of individual retail establishments that can be accessed. Clearly, the northern parcel wins out because of the SNCD located right in the middle of it is absolutely packed with destinations. So today, many of people say that Denver is a car city and that we can never stop being a car city. I'd argue that they are wrong. For the first half of its history, Denver was a transit-oriented city, and the portion of the city that developed around a streetcar, the green in the map, and the sea of car and suburbia around it has a bone to be an exceptionally walkable and transit-friendly, once more, if only we put our minds to it. After graduating, I co-founded DMB Denver, standing for Yes in My Backyard, to push forward this multimodal-friendly version for Central Denver. In order to bring this to fruition, we must accommodate more people in that green area so that transit can truly compete with the convenience of the car. 
we must also build more in order to solve the housing crisis. Otherwise, the yellow boundary at the fringe of the city will become ever more expansive and out of reach of effective transit. Through some of the media coverage I've received from this project, I believe it has presented Denver in a new light to many people. For half of its existence, as I said before, Denver was a transit and walking city. By leveraging the synergy of good transportation and land use planning, we can become one again, and I think we'd all be better off for it. You can check out EMB Denver at www.embdenver.org and my story map as shown on the screen at bit.ly backslash Denver Streetcar Legacy. Thank you. Ryan, let me get your, uh, do you have any social media, anything like that, just to make sure that we could pass on to everyone who's uh, listening today? Yeah, EMB Denver is also on Facebook. Uh, we've got a group and a page if you just search EMB Denver there. And we are also on Twitter at the handle EMB in Denver. You know, this is a great start to what we're doing right now, and it's great to see the uh, just how Denver has been in the past, understanding how the streets and everything has been organized because of, well, what happened with streetcars. But with that, we have to go from streetcars all the way to the library. And with that, that brings on the next guest that we'll have, which will be Evan Derby. And Evan, extremely excited to have you on and to talk about why it's so important to spend your Fridays at the library. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, share that with you all. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Evan Derby, and uh, today I'd like to be I like to share with you my story about my Fridays at the library. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the Central Branch of the Denver Public Library. Um, and the first time that I went to the Central Branch was with my dad. We would go on adventures when I was a kid and uh, come down to the city. But my story with the library really comes down to an adventure that I had in 2018. I spent the summer of 2018 uh, in San Francisco, um, working and uh, living there, taking BART and riding my bike up and down the hills. And it was good to see how a place in the US that was other than Denver handled transit and handled walkability. But the experience that I really had came later in 2018 when I studied abroad in Heidelberg, Germany. And so in Germany, um, transit is everywhere. This is the bus that I took to get to my classes every day, but I was also able to take the bus to the pub to other cities and it really allowed me to explore uh, for example here in Berlin uh, this is the U-Bahn the yellow BVG uh, train and um, in Europe transit is for everybody you would see people of all ages uh, all classes on transit and it was really something that built the community and allowed people to get around. And so when I came back, I decided, well, you know, I had some free time. I wanted to volunteer at the library. And so to start that journey, I started at the University of Denver light rail station. Um, I would take the light rail uh, down a couple of stops, just whichever light rail was coming by. And I would take it to the I-25 and Broadway station where I would then take the zero line uh, going north. Um, the zero line goes up uh, Lincoln um, along uh, Broadway and I would take zero line several stops up to uh, Lincoln and 13th. And then you sort of just cross the um, street there and the library is right there. And so a lot of my friends asked me, you know, why would you why would you want to take public transit? Um, they had had bad experiences with people on transit in Denver, and it was interesting that that wasn't an experience that I had had when I was in Europe. I hadn't had bad experiences with people on transit in Europe. And ultimately, it comes down to a sort of self fulfilling prophecy that we have, uh, an idea that we have about who it should read or who should be taking transit. We have this idea that transit is for homeless and lower income folks and we end up funding the systems and treating them that way. But the reality is that transit has to, doesn't have to be that way. If we have a transit system that gets people where they want to go, then a lot of people will use it. And one example of that is the subway system in New York City. All of the states colored in red here have a lower population than the daily subway ridership in New York City. And that just shows that it will really work if we want it to. But the other thing about transit in the US is that we have let it become part of our social safety net. We have a very weak safety net in the US and transit ends up taking on the some of those responsibilities that it really isn't funded enough to be good at and that it really isn't supposed to be good at. 
Now, transit kind of shares this quality with a library. When I went to the library on Fridays, I volunteered at the CTC, the Community Technology Center on the sixth floor. And another thing that is on the sixth floor at the, at the library are offices for social workers. And often those were the most requested assets at the library. Now, the library is an incredible community building resource. Um, I was so happy to be there. Uh, they gave me my badge, even though I had only been there for maybe two or three days at that point. And I met just so many different types of people, young, old, rich, poor, that were there that could you know, you could possibly imagine. And they even gave back to me. Um, they helped me with some of my projects and they helped me with a lot of things that, uh, you know, um, in terms of uh, meeting with people in the community. Now, uh, transit could be the same way if we give it the same attention and don't treat it as something that's only for poor people. Now, of course, going to the library and taking the bus to the library, I had to bring a book. And so these were two books that I read while I would be at the library. One is Walkable City by Jeff Speck, and the other is Better Buses, Better Cities by Stephen Higgishide. And both of these lay out different ways that we can transform our, our transit systems and our city itself to be better. And one thing that you learn um, from these when you see them is uh, just the uh, prevalence of the automobile in our cities. Uh, this is the tail end of Union Station, and you can see just how much space in the picture is devoted to cars. And it really reduces the walkability. Uh, that's in contrast to somewhere like in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where there's a certain amount of space set aside for bike paths, set aside for transit ways. And of course, all of this goes along with a certain amount of density that allows it to all be possible. In Denver, we can have those things, but we need to make those decisions and give up that space to do those things in the same way that we've given that space to the library. Now, in Denver, we do have uh, definitely have de definitely do have dense walkable neighborhoods. The area around Union Station and in downtown is definitely one of those places. Um, but it's a uh, it should be a jumping off point. It should be somewhere that we can see places where we need to make a change. And so you can see here back to the University of Denver light rail station. There's probably 15 lanes of car traffic on either side of these two lanes of the light rail. And it just shows sort of what our pr current priorities are and what we should be changing to, uh, you know, to make transit better. Um, back in Germany, this is a place in Heidelberg called Bismarckplatz. It's a place that's basically the center of the city. All of the bus lines run through it and all of the tram lines run through it. And it's clear that because transit is important here and they want transit to work, they've taken that uh, they've taken that space and given power to the institution of transit to make people's lives better. And I think right now in Denver with the pandemic, we're trying something new with shared streets where we're giving space back to people on streets. And part of that moving forward will have to be giving space back to transit and giving it the um, resources and funding that it needs. Thank you. Evan, that is tremendous. You know, it's very interesting um, to just think about the importance of being able to give the streets or to give the land right back to the people rather than the automobiles. It's actually a very interesting concept when you really think about it, but I think it's just tremendous, especially another thing, too, before we get to our next speaker. You look at all the wasted space. I thought it was very interesting when you look at by the University of Denver, when you look at Union Station. I see areas where you can have housing, areas where you can have of a rec center. You can have something there, a park, where actually people can be able to thrive rather than having a car there. Very good stuff right there, Evan. Thank Absolutely. You so much for that. Thank you, Justin. All right. And with that, let's go to our last speaker of the day and a man who's going to bring it all home, and that's Spencer McCullough. And Spencer talks about where the shared streets, which is are just extremely, extremely important and something that I can't wait for you all to hear. Spencer, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hey everyone, my name's Spencer. Uh, in this talk, I talk about how our streets are for more than just cars. Um, you know, the way we use them right now, they seem to be only a place where people can drive and store their private cars. Um, but by the end of this presentation, I hope you see that they can be a lot more than that. Maybe we aren't utilizing them as well as we can be. Um, when I think of the word streets, I think of a place, uh, you know, that's not safe for me, not a place I belong. I was raised as a kid, look both ways, hold my hand, don't play in the street. Uh, unless I'm driving somewhere, it's really not a place I'm supposed to be, uh, which is unfortunate because it makes up so much of our 
public space around town. Uh, now, I've seen the classic European movies with the car-free cities, uh, and I've read the magazine articles about how Amsterdam has more bikes than they have people, and I always thought that that was just a way, uh, you know, the old world worked, something that wouldn't work here. Um, but in the last year or so, I've met people, read things, and kind of realized that that's not the case. Um, our car-dominated streets right now are less a choice that we've made and more kind of an oversight or a passive choice we've come to. We didn't decide to give our roads over to cars, um, but we didn't decide to do anything else with them. That's kind of where we are right now. But but we can make choices that you know take us to a different reality. This summer, we've gotten to experience what these streets might be like through the Shared Streets program. Uh, shared Streets program uh, creates streets where cars are deprioritized to pedestrians and cyclists, so they yield and people can use the full width of the road. The intention with these is to give people more place to socially distance during COVID-19. Uh, the Denver Bicycle Lobby right now is collecting signatures on our petition to make these streets permanent. We want to keep these after the pandemic's over and expand this network. Uh, we have a section on our petition where folks can leave comments for us, and I wanted to share a few of those comments that we've gotten. Um, in this presentation. I'm running, biking, and walking on these streets. I like the freedom and safety I feel when I'm on these streets. I'm not worried about getting run off the road by a car. I also feel like it gives me so many more options and so much more freedom when running in the parks. Safety is a huge theme that we've uh, come across in these comments. People love these streets because they don't feel like they're taking their lives in their own hands. I live on a shared street. I love the quiet. I love seeing friends and neighbors enjoying the street. I love watching wobbly kids practicing on their big boy bikes. I love that cars can get by as needed, but don't feel comfortable. So they're slower and more cautious. I love that safety makes everyone much more relaxed. These streets add a lot to the community because uh, you can see and interact with your neighbors, unlike when they're driving. I'm walking 11th and 16th and teaching my girlfriend to identify the trees as the leaves come in. Yes, please make it permanent. These streets are not just a place for transportation, but also for building relationships, you know, personal relationships as well as larger community relationships. And right now we're only let, letting people drive and store their personal cars here. My favorite use for the shared streets have been our double yellow line happy hours. This is over at 16th and Gaylord. If you see us out one day, come by and say hello. Um, but I just love how much it makes this neighborhood feel more like a community now. I see my neighbors more often, they're out. I can pop in and say hello without having to make formal plans. Uh, and then this comment really sums it up well. Smaller carbon footprint when streets are for foot traffic only and a better community feeling. Uh, our our air has been full of smoke and ash these last you know couple of weeks, really this whole summer. We should be encouraging people to get out of their cars and making it safe for them to do so, not doubling down on cars. But instead, we're spending $1.2 billion, uh, quote unquote, improving a 10 mile stretch of I-70, while a lot of neighborhoods in this city don't even have serviceable sidewalks. Um, you know, that just kind of shows where our priorities are right now, and they're not in a great place, uh, and this is something we can change. These are sidewalks in Denver. Uh, what's odd about the way we maintain sidewalks here is that it actually falls to the property owner to maintain and keep up their sidewalk. Uh, and I could you imagine what the roads would look like if every housing plot had a different kind of road in front of it based on when the, the house was built uh, and those owners had to maintain those streets. Um, and here's a parklet. Uh, this is actually illegal to build in the city of Denver unless you have one of the emergency COVID-19 permits. There's no other way to do it. Yet we let car owners store their private cars there for free or maybe $2 an hour if it's a really popular area. Uh, if you look at this cartoon on the left, once we remove the space dedicated solely for cars, it shows how little space in cities is actually left for pedestrians. And on the right, you see a four lane road through a neighborhood while there's not even a serviceable sidewalk there. Uh, again, these streets are supposed to work for everyone. It's it's our big shared public space. But uh, And then here we see a space where neighbors are gathering between their buildings. Public spaces, one of the greatest values they provide is allowing neighbors to strengthen their relationships, allowing serendipitous meetings between people who live in communities, uh, creating stronger, more resilient communities, making us better off to fight things like COVID-19 and climate change. Now, the space outside of your house, what would you rather have there? You know, a park, a little market. Uh, it doesn't have to be a place where people store their cars or zoom past while you're sitting outside. It can be a pleasant place you want to hang out. Streets haven't always been like that. 
streets can be really anything we want them to be uh, if we so choose. We could have a place that looks like this. This is what Denver could look like, you know, like, you know, but um, these are choices uh, that we made. These are choices that we made. <laughs> we could be yeah. running errands by bike, running errands relaxed, by bike. Out, relaxed for out for a stroll, but instead, stroll. again, we just allow cars to zoom up and down these throughways. Um, cars don't have to take up all of the space. Now, I'm no one special. I'm just a guy who doesn't want to get murdered on his bike uh, while out running errands. You have the ability to make these changes happen, um, either on your own or with groups, writing your council members, calling the Department of Transportation, and letting them know how you feel about changes that are made in your area. Um, so please sign our petition at thesharedstreetsdenver.com. Uh, if you want to get more involved, there's contact information on that website. If you have an idea for something you'd love to see in your neighborhood and you're not really sure how to get started on that or you just kind of feel alone and stuck and overwhelmed, please reach out. We want to help you. Uh, this is a hard thing to do alone, but we can do a lot together. Spencer, I'm loving it, man. That's great stuff that you're doing. Uh, and I, I tell you this. First of all, for everybody who's here, this has just been so impressive, right? I mean, have you learned something today? Because I've learned a whole lot. Here's the biggest thing about Spencer's deal is that there's so much that's allocated to vehicles, <laughs> to the people operating the cars rather than the people themselves, right? So when you think about, let's go and put $1.2 billion down. Well, yeah, that's important. We all get that. But at the same time, to make sure that everybody has a sidewalk they can walk on or they can jog on for every neighborhood, that's also important as well. So Spencer, truly, truly a tremendous job. And thank you so much for that. So with that being said, that would be our last uh, session of uh, fast and curious. Uh, this again being our closing session. So, with that being said, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions? Please feel free to let us know. And with that, actually, I'm going to turn it back over to Kayla. Uh, I see Kurt out there. I don't know if I'm supposed to speak to you, Kurt, but I'm going to turn this over to Kayla and we're going to have our QA. Sure. So, um, let's see, definitely uh, put in the comments if you have any questions for our presenters. Um, I think we've got some we wanted to start with. Um, and for for any of the the speakers that just spoke, um, what is one favorite creative way that you have seen people using streets this year um, that you maybe never have expected? My favorite use that I saw this year was a gentleman who had set up a like DJ stand on his balcony and was spinning music to folks that walked by or were sitting in the parking lot across from their uh, apartment building. I had just been out for a jog and happened to come across that. And it was lovely. Yeah, for me, um, one of my sort of favorite uh, parts about seeing the shared streets has just been the opportunity to uh, ride uh, my bikes with my friends. Um, before the pandemic, uh, I, I live with a bunch of housemates, and um, none of them rode bikes. And uh, during this, the during the pandemic, we've had the opportunity to um, ride our bikes just about everywhere, and so having me and my four or five friends writing down one of the shared streets um, has really been able to bring, let me bring uh, the sort of bicycle culture and um, the benefits of biking to them. Yeah, and I would also say, uh, uh, I was actually in one of the pictures, one of Spencer's pictures hanging out uh, on 16th, over on 16th and Gaylord. I mean, just, I never imagined being out there. Like I got a lawn chair, like eating food in the middle of the street like it was just kind of surreal and i think it was really cool and there's a big we had like a dozen people there all right next question oh go ahead I'm sorry i wanted to point out that was actually my yellow line a happy hour but one of my favorite things was on 11th avenue there was an entire band on pedicabs going very slowly. There was a guy walking in front, but there was a guy on a uh, saxophone, a woman on keyboard. There was a drum set in a pedicab and they were just like, just rolling up and down 11th Avenue. It was so much fun.
thing is spectacular. All right, but that said, here's question number two. How can I tell if my neighborhood is a streetcar NBHD? Somebody got to let me know about this one. Um, oh, there, there's my video. Um, yeah, that sounds like a question for me. Um, so basically, yeah. Um, how do you know there's a streetcar that went around your neighborhood? Well, you can actually, aside from the commercial corridors themselves, which is where the lines directly ran, where you got those 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 commercial buildings with with entrances that are flush to the sidewalk without a parking setback. Um, if you want to talk about residential areas, like could I have walked to a streetcar historically? Um, generally, the answer to that is, do you have an alley? Um, if the answer to that is yes, then your neighborhood was probably built uh, sometime at the latest in World War II, probably earlier. Um, and that is roughly coincides with when the last streetcar ran. And so, yeah, all of the older parts of Denver, if you've got an alley, um, yeah, you could probably walk to a streetcar uh, if you were here uh, 80 maybe 90 years ago now, however long ago that was, do the math. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, guys. I'm still here at work, so I'm just trying to get a couple things done from here from there. But um, let me go to our next question real quick, if you don't mind. Um, I like this one. What are some solutions for addressing recreational uh, recreation streets in the areas outside of downtown Denver in more dense areas. Did anybody hear me? Oh yeah, can you repeat the question? Sorry, it cut out a little yeah. for me. Yeah, no worries about that. Um, what are some solutions for addressing recreation streets in the areas outside of downtown Denver's more dense areas? I think one of the best ways to go about kind of getting shared street space in these less dense areas uh, is talking to your neighbors and talking to the representatives that represent you, uh, finding any groups that operate in that area and starting to talk about it. Uh, the shared streets have been a big fight. There's a lot of people working in the background to make sure that these stay open and that they got opened in the first place. Um, and so the more people you can have get excited about possibly shared street in your area, um, the easier it will be to implement something like that. You really need a critical mass. If you're the only one on your block talking about it, it's gonna be really tough. I wanna ask this question too, and this could be to anyone in the panelist. Um, why is this important? And in the sense of, when you look at just a common individual, who would wonder about what's going on in the streets. They don't know the history. They just believe that things are the way that they are and they will always be that way. Why is it important to create a change specifically where it comes to our transportation? Um, I think in a car centric city that we live in, uh, like the one we live in now, um, it's very, it can be very isolating. There's lots of dead space with these parking lots. Buildings are more isolating because they're cut off from one another with, again, parking requirements. Um, it makes it hard for us to walk anywhere. It makes it unpleasant to do anything but drive and it becomes this vicious cycle. Uh, but if we change the way transportation is prioritized, then building codes will change, zoning requirements will change and we'll get a very different environment than we live in now. It won't be like we have a bike lane that you still have to ride three miles to get to a store. The stores will come closer to you as these things change. So yeah. good. And I, I well, want to here too. I mean, this is really, um, this is a climate issue the way I see it. Um, and 2020 has really brought home just how bad the climate crisis has gotten. But, but transportation, emissions generated from the transportation sector is an enormous percentage of the total generated by this country and if we we can't just say oh the electric car is going to save us that's not going to happen soon enough it's going to take a very long time we need to use all the tools in our toolbox in order to meet the climate crisis head on and one of the best things we can do is redesign our communities to make it so we don't have to rely on these several thousand pound machines to get us around just to do basic errands basic life essentials 
everyone should be able to walk to the grocery store. Everyone should be able to, every kid should be able to walk to school. You should be able to get everything you need on, on a, either a walk or, or a convenient and practical transit ride. And our carbon emissions will plummet if we adopt those lifestyles. Uh, and I think that's the direction. That's what, that's why, at least in my view, the number one reason why Denver needs to move in this direction. Yeah, I'd uh, I'd also like to add in um, just the you know uh, racial and social justice issues that um, come with transit. Um, you know, uh, I remember hearing a statistic, um, I think it was um, centered around uh, Chicago, but it just talked about how the, um, it talked about how the, um, basically having access to transit is a major way for people to get out of poverty. Um, if you can get to another part of the city that has a, a good paying job, um, it, it's just sort of economics. And so uh, transit being something that everybody can take um, to get around the city, to access new opportunities, um, to you know visit with family and friends um, also has a, a major role in uh, you know, uh, in racial and um, social justice uh, issues. You know, guys, I think all of those are tremendous um, examples of why it's so important. And here's another thing, too, before we get to our next question. Remember when the coronavirus pandemic first hit and everyone was told, hey, you had to stay inside? And then it was like the environment cleared up. It was like people actually got outside and started to walk. And even though we were social distancing, it was still that interaction. One thing that we also miss is, even with social distancing, we still had human connection. And one of the things, um, Spencer, I believe you brought this up was, when you have so many cars, you can actually have isolation inside of your vehicle. It's all about you listening to your song, your podcast, and you're not really interacting with anyone else. But when you start to walk and you walk around your own neighborhood, that's when you start to interact with other people as well. That is so important to see. Here's another question, guys. If you had $10,000, which I hope that somebody out there does for me, which would be awesome. And all the permits, what would you do with your street? Yes, what would you do with your street with $10,000 and all the permits? Tell us what it will look like, what it feels like, what it smells like, and also what it sounds like. Let's start with uh, Spencer. If I had $10,000 for the street that I live on, uh, first thing I would do is put up big barricades at the end that were very pretty, you know, probably like flower boxes or something. So that car traffic wasn't coming down there. Uh, and then I would probably put in benches, maybe some of those tables, like on like the chess tables on 16th street uh, and a lot more flower boxes and start kind of farming or I guess growing things in the, the setback area right on the curb uh, and really try to make this street feel a bit cozier, I guess. Like there's a lot of extra space, but if you can build these little nook areas to it where people can gather and uh, kind of have this warm feeling, I guess, yeah, that's the first thing I would do. Evan, how about yourself, my friend? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I recently moved uh, to a more suburban area of Denver and the, the street in front of my house um, actually has a center turning lane, which seemed very odd to me to be in a residential neighborhood. Um, I kind of see why it's there. The the um, street is relatively busy. Um, and so I guess if, you know, if I had my way, um, I would just want to take back some of that empty space from the turning lane and um, maybe put in a, per a parking protected bike lane on, uh, on the street. Um, just to give people a little bit more safety there. Um, I've tried riding my bike up and down that street and it's a little bit terrifying um, with how many people are speeding by and uh, having a big wide uh, center turning lane really um, contributes to high high speeds on my street. And so I think narrowing the um, the road and putting in a bike lane would be a great way to um, to do that and it would make it a little bit more friendly for, um, for the bikes that uh, choose to to go up and down my street. That's great. Last but not least, Ryan, what do you think, my man? Um, what I'm thinking is that a lot of streets in Denver, my street's not too bad. It could use a few more, but I'll, trees can do wonders for making a street more pleasant to walk. I mean, in, in, in the summer, it protects you from that heat. 
in the fall, I mean, the shade goes away, and so it's not like it's keeping you too cold because they shed their leaves. Uh, and so there's a lot of streets. You ever, like, it's a really hot day, um, the sun's beating down on you, and it's just a, some of these arterial streets in this barren wasteland of concrete. And imagine if there was just like, nonstop trees over your head. It's so much nicer. And I think one street that could really use that is Colfax, especially. There have been some brutal days on Colfax. It's like, I kind of get off the street. I'd rather walk the neighborhood streets to my destination because there's just no trees. And so I think, yeah, you can do plant. I don't know how many trees can you plant for $10,000. I don't know. But that's my idea. I like the trees, but nobody talked about the filling, man. What will the what smell be like? That's what I was looking for. I guess it would smell like a whole lot of pine on Ryan's uh, neighborhood, especially with uh, with all the trees that you have. All right, let's move on to the next question. How can we make the bus or streets in general work better for everyone? I'll uh, go ahead and start out with this one. Um, for me, the taking the bus and making it more accessible and uh, you know friendly for everyone um, goes back to something that uh, Stephen Higgishai talks about in Better Buses, Better Cities, um, which is making the bus sort of dignified and walkable. Um, and so it really comes comes down to uh, things like putting um, bus stops in places that are actually sort of nice to hang out. Um, one of my uh, least favorite bus stops, I could say, is a Long Spear. Um, it's right near the, um, it's right near Downing. Um, it's on this uh, sort of bridge that goes over the Cherry Creek Trail, and it's just very narrow um, sidewalk, and there's a bus stop there. And so, making the bus dignified and making the bus walkable means uh, having a place for people to actually sit and not be, you know, about 12 inches away from cars while they're trying to wait for the bus. Um, it means having bus shelters. It means having bus stops that are actually clearly marked. Um, it's really hard to tell that there's a bus stop there on Spear because uh, some of the trees from the um, creek area have come and sort of um, are giving shade and uh, sort of blocking the um, place, uh, blo blocking the sign for the bus stop. And so making a bus stop an actual comfortable place to be and a comfortable place to wait for the bus um, is really important. And a lot of uh, Stephen Higgishide's book, or at least a, a chapter of it, talks about um, making friendly places and places that people actually want to sit and wait for the bus stop. And so I would hope that um, in Denver we could have uh, uh, with RTD, we could have some sort of discussion about, you know, where bus stops should be located and how to give them enough space that they're actually pleasant places to sit and pleasant places to uh, pleasant places to be and not places where you're really scared because you're about a foot away from traffic going about 50 miles an hour. That's a brilliant answer. <laughs> That's a perfect answer. Great stuff right there. I got another question for you guys. And uh, I'm going to go with this one for Evan. If you could ask our audience to do one action. Oh, you know, I'm not just going to leave this to Evan. I'm going to leave this for everybody. If you could ask our audience to do one action, just one, to make streets for people in Denver safer, or just in general, or just in general, what would that be? Uh, uh, sure, I'll uh, start off. Um, if I could ask other people to do something um, that they, you know, that they specifically could uh, do um, well, well, individually. Let me, yeah, let me, yeah let, me, let me actually change that a little bit. If you could ask our audience to do one action to make streets for people in Denver. So not just safe, make the streets for the people in Denver. What would that be? Yeah, I guess my answer is um, just be a uh, vocal voice in your community about these issues. Um, anybody that knows me knows that uh, since I got into this um, about a year and a half ago, I really haven't shut up about it. And I think I've uh, you know, spread the good word about um, positive changes that we can make in our city. And so just being a part of a local conversation, talking to your neighbors, talking to your family members, um, kind of showing people that something else is possible, you know, that uh, something better is possible than what we have right now. Um, that's something that you can do to start start the change, start making streets uh, be for everybody and not just for cars. Ryan, I'm gonna have you answer this one next, my friend. Yeah, jumped up on the desk here. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that Evan said. Uh, I'd say just generally getting clued in onto what's going on is also really important. Um, get on the Denver Streets Partnership newsletter because if there's if there's they can they're a big enough organization that if momentum is building on something we can they put out calls to action and you can collectively um, 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 lobby our elected officials. Uh, if there's any sort of city planning initiative going on, get on those newsletters. Get on your city council person's newsletters. Go meet your city council person. Um, and I also suggest uh, going to yemidenver.org and signing up for our newsletter as well. Um, but yeah, just just communicate. There are people uh, who have influence in the city government over how our streets are designed. And it's very important that they are constantly uh, reminded of what your concerns are about how to make safer streets. All right, Spencer, what you got for us? Uh, I'll ask you the question one more time. If you could ask our audience to do one action to make streets for people in Denver, what would that be? I'll, I'll plug our petition, sharedstreetsdenver.com. Uh, we've shared that with the city, uh, the Department of Transportation, multiple times. Uh, we're about to do it again soon. Uh, these signatures really do help. It holds them accountable. It shows them how folks are using the streets. Uh, and then a lot like what Evan said, have these conversations with your friends, tell them about this. Folks don't realize that this is a conversation being had, that this is something they can have a hand in. Uh, and the more people we talk to about this, the more we get them to think about their streets differently, uh, the more likely these changes will stick. I love it. All right, guys, last question for right now on the panel is pretty simple. How can we spread these stories, successes, and ideas to more people, like people who primarily drive, kind of like Individuals like myself, <laughs> Spencer, we'll start off with you. Um, something I try to do to kind of share these success stories is have one-on-one -on -one experiences with folks. Um, you know, if I'm going to a friend's house or if they're coming over, we're going to do something, you know, asking them how they're going to get there, talk about biking, maybe take them out and guide them through this and show them the shared streets, show them the bike lanes that we have show them the good that's being done now and talk about where we can go really holding their hand through that because a lot of folks either might be scared to bike or just not actually think about it um but when they hear it from people that they trust their friends they're more likely to to give these things a shot and see how great they can be evan you're up my friend what do you think yeah, I mean, uh, spreading spreading the message, as I said, um, is really important, and I would totally echo what Spencer said. Um, I've definitely had a lot of good conversations with my friends and family where um, we'll be out doing something, or uh, I'll be trying to plan something with somebody, and they'll say, oh, you know, I'm planning on riding my bike over there, or I'm planning on walking there, or um, much to my parents' uh, annoyance, I've been, you know, uh, riding the bus up to Boulder and um, talking about my experiences riding the bus um, when I go and visit my parents. And so um, being able to sort of show other people that, um, you know, even though our system right now uh, needs work, um, showing that it actually works for you and showing that it's possible to have really good experiences with biking and with transit. And so um, that's what I hoped you all got out of my presentation with the library is the library is such an amazing resource and I was able to access it and grow because of transit. And so I would say, uh, you know, if you can, um, if you can show other people uh, the positive benefits that it would, that transit and that walkability and that biking have um, in a really physical and personal way, then you're really going to connect with them um, in a way that maybe just sharing articles on Facebook uh, uh, doesn't have the same effect. All right, Ryan, you're the last guy. You got to bring us home. What do you have for us? Oh, yeah, I hate to sound like a broken record, everyone, but it is about the conversations. It's, 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 it's challenging people's assumptions about about the way they're living their life and showing that there is an alternative um uh and it's not, and, and and demonstrations are also really good i grew up in suburban indianapolis six years ago all this stuff was completely foreign to me all right i didn't even i couldn't even imagine conversations like we're having now but one of my most formative experiences with all this was when i was a graduate student well when i was accepted to the university of denver i had a campus tour and everything and then there was several grad students there and they organized a bike ride from the University of Denver to downtown. 
And I was really nervous. I never rode a bike on city streets before. I was used to maybe my subdivision and like the park. Like riding a bike in the street seemed like nuts to me. But there's this big group ride night and I borrowed a bike and we went to downtown and it kind of blew my mind. It was so much fun. Um, and, and experiences like that, you're, you're never going to win over everyone. There's going to be people who are hardcore. I don't want to change. I like my lifestyle. But if you can bring people, like demonstrate these things, like say, hey, I can walk to 10 different businesses in five minutes where I live. Isn't that amazing? I can walk, walk to the grocery store in five minutes. I got a liquor store in my corner. I can go to all these restaurants. I don't have to worry about getting an Uber home. If I get if I have a night out because I can walk back, that's a huge amenity. And if you talk about the benefits of all this, um, the people who are on the edge, people who are remotely open to any of this, I think we can bring them over. It's just a question of exposing them to it. Ryan, before we let you go, is it possible to have a cat park as well in your neighborhood? Would that be all right? A cat park? <laughs> uh, I don't know about uh, cats. Cats are usually more not so friendly to other cats uh, <laughs> often. So. But I have I've done a couple of leash walks with him, although okay. following the cat, not very. I kind of gave up on that. I tried a few times, so <laughs> nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but with that, guys, I just wanted to say this: I've learned so much through this. As you know, I do sports, but I do news as well at Channel Four, and just the opportunity to be able to see this and also to learn something new. Um, has greatly impacted me and hopefully impacted the rest of our audience as well. At the end of the day, if there's one common thread that I believe we all could agree on is that we need to make sure that we stay connected together. Yes, it's important to have vehicles to get you from point A to point B, but never let vehicles be more important than the people who are inside driving them. It's about us being able to stay connected and not isolated as well. So with that, we turn it back over to Kayla, who has done a fantastic job to wrap everything up from here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jason, Justin, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, that was a really uh, great session. Uh, I really enjoyed it and hearing um, all of your stories and unique perspectives. Um, so this is the end of our summit. Thank you everyone for sticking through our four days. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, I want to make sure that you uh, take a moment to reflect on how we did and let us know. Uh, we did send out an evaluation this morning. I'll send it out one more time. Um, please take a moment to fill out that survey. Let us know how you liked the sessions that you did attend uh, and where we could, could improve. Uh, this is our first virtual summit, so let us know how it went um, and what we should do again next time. Um, and definitely stay connected. I think we all heard that's really important to keep these conversations going, keep communicating, keep talking to each other, keep talking to our neighbors and our communities. I think that's even more important now um, during our the year that 2020 has given us. Um, so definitely keep doing that. I hope that you've found people throughout the summit that you can connect to. I encourage you to do that. This is a community that's open to connecting. I think all of our speakers have mentioned that reach out to them. If you don't know how to reach out to them, reach out to me or Denver Streets Partnership because we probably know them uh, and we will connect you to them. This is all about connecting and we want to get get everyone connected and keep working on this work together. Um, so thank you all very much for giving us your time on the Saturday and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you. Did I freeze? They were good. Okay. My screen froze right at the end there, but you guys heard me? Okay. <laughs> we can hear you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Stay in touch. All right. Take care. we Will do. Thank you again. Thanks, Justin. You're welcome. See you guys. Thank you, Evan, Ryan, Spencer. All right. Bye. Goodbye.